Hey, 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 everyone. Mime Flare Retro back with you after a little bit of a break. Only about a year. Sorry about that, but hey, everyone needs a break once in a while. I hope everyone is doing well. I've been doing a little bit of retro reminiscing lately. And it's interesting as a retro computer collector. Well, I call it collecting, but Mrs. Mindflare Retro calls it something else. I can't remember, starts with an H. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I've been sitting on a little bit of retro computer history for too long without sharing with the community. But that's going to change right now, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. I have come to learn that there is a lot of unusual and very interesting retro computer hardware and software still out there lurking silently in people's basements, lofts, garages, closets, completely dormant. If you're a retro computer enthusiast, I hope you stick around and follow me on this interesting journey that leads me to inadvertently rediscovering a small piece of forgotten Commodore 64 history. All with the help of the fates, Lady Luck, and most importantly, friends in the retro computer community. The latter includes Robin from 8-Bit Show & Tell, who drops in later in this video to add a little bit of technical perspective to this story. So I hope you stick around for that. If you do get bored of me blathering on, there are index links in the description. But you won't be bored. Just sit back and please enjoy this little story. <laughs> I first came to appreciate the amount of no longer used and long forgotten retro computer hardware there still was available to be rediscovered when I rediscovered my original C64 about six years ago. Well, I always knew where it was. It was in its original box, stored safely in my basement. It was at that time that a series of events and decisions got me back into 80s retro computing fun, or I guess I should say got me into retro computing. And that journey has led me to becoming a part of an amazing retro computer community, a welcoming, supportive, knowledgeable, and enthusiastic group of tens of thousands of people all around the world. Now, bear with me and let me get into a little bit of backstory that started one ordinary weekend in 2016 and led to, well, this video today. So, one lazy weekend in early 2016, I decided to dig out my old C64 from storage and set it up to show my son. I removed it from its original box, and I was surprised to see that it looked the same as the day I had packed it away almost three decades ago. I set it up on my desk with my 1541 floppy drive and a Commodore 2002 monitor that I still had from my Amiga 500 days and powered it all on. Ah, yes. The blue screen of life blinked ready in all its glory once again. We loaded up Back to the Future from Floppy. Surprisingly, all my old floppy disks seemed to work fine, and we played for a while. But then tragedy. The red power light on my beloved C64 started to slowly fade. Before I knew it, my C64 went dark and quiet. I was mortified. Once I collected my thoughts, I decided this fate from my precious childhood C64 was not acceptable at all. I made the decision, and I was going to fix it. Somehow, no matter what, I'm going to fix it. So I started researching Commodore 64 repair online. Of course, I did the typical YouTube rabbit hole thing. I discovered some of the YouTube greats, Gadget UK, BWAC, Retro Game Mods, who sadly doesn't make videos anymore. These were the first channels I latched onto for C64 repair knowledge. I started to soak in all the information I could, and after a while, and after reconstituting my old simple electronics hobby workbench, I did repair my good old C64. It felt great to actually be able to bring my childhood computer back to life, and I started to think of how many other people out there still have Commodore 64s, Ataris, and other retro computers sitting in a box, hiding away, completely forgotten and how many of those people come across those old computers and just throw them away in the garbage. So I said, what the heck? I made the decision to post wanted ads on local buy and sell websites like Craigslist and Kijiji. And to my surprise, the response was almost immediate and better than I had expected. 
Some people were looking to sell old retro gear for a negotiated fair price, and some people just wanted to donate their old 80s computers to a worthy cause. That being me and my newly discovered hobby and campaign to collect and preserve retro computers. After several small and a few huge hauls, things started to pile up faster than I could open and investigate what was in each box. And I tried to repair and refurbish these computers as best I could. This was an exciting work hobby for me, but it got to the point where I also wanted to share my excitement and experience with other people of my vintage on social media. So I started on Twitter, and then after I got enough nerve, I started creating YouTube videos, and Mindflow Retro was born. I am definitely not an expert, but I learn as much as I can from those who are more knowledgeable than I am, and in turn, hopefully inform and teach others who share a passion for preservation of retro computers. In collecting retro computer gear, you sometimes come across some hidden treasures, which is always a treat. Sometimes there are no treats, and sometimes those hidden treasures are quite unexpected and very interesting. In February 2018, I had a C64 on the bench for repair. It was part of a random small pickup weeks earlier. It was a typical non-working black screen C64, and I didn't think too much of it at that moment. I popped the lid to examine the board inside to see if there was anything obvious. Well, something did stand out right away. The original kernel ROM had been replaced with what looked like to be a socketed EEPROM. Hmm. I extracted the mystery chip and installed it in my Ziff Test 64 and powered it on. And this is what I saw. Master ROM 64? What the heck is this? I quickly fired off a tweet showing what I had stumbled upon and asked if anyone knew anything about this kernel replacement. No one had. My friend Game Whisperer in Wales took interest in this mystery and a crafty bit of detective work began. Based on the ready screen, we knew the name of the product, Master ROM 64. We also knew the name of the company that released it, Norland, and we knew a release date, 1987. So off we went to work. I tracked down a small ad on page 108 of Run Magazine from January 1988 advertising Master ROM 64 being sold by a computer retailer in the Toronto area, so I thought that it might be a homegrown product. I left this tidbit of info with Game Whisperer and I went to bed for the evening. Well, I woke up the next day and he had messaged me with some very interesting info. His full credit, Game Whisperer had been doing some masterful sleuth work. Game Whisperer found a PDF copy of the show guide from the 1985 World of Commodore Expo in Toronto. This was a large four day expo hosted by Commodore Canada in December every year through the mid and late 80s. The show guide always listed the vendors with a booth in the show, and this year in booth 340 was Norland Agencies Limited of Milton, Ontario, Canada promoting Commodore computer items, as well as Norland General Commodore software. And it even listed a contact name, a gentleman named Gus. Could this be the Norland company behind Master ROM 64? Game Whisper dug even deeper, and we had our answer in the 1986 World of Commodore show guide. The Norland company was listed there yet again as a vendor, and this time all of their main software products were also listed including Master ROM 64. Bingo! Now, without getting into too many specifics, Game Whisperer went the extra mile and further researched our man Gus of Norland Agencies Limited and actually came up with some contact information. This was a massive break in the case. We now had confirmation that Norland was a Canadian company and it was likely owned and operated by Gus. It was time to make contact. I drafted an email and sent it off to Gus to an email address that we weren't even sure was correct or was even active anymore, and there was no response. Until about a week later, when I did get a reply, we had indeed tracked down and made contact with the man who owned the Norland company. Gus and I enjoyed a fantastic email correspondence back and forth for several days, and he started to fill me in with all he could remember about Master ROM 64. Even better, it turned out that Gus still lives in the town of Milton, Ontario, and where, thank goodness, is Milton, Ontario? About a 20 minute drive from my home. So, Gus invited me over for a quick meetup, 
and he was happy to tell me all about his days as a Commodore 64 developer and software business owner. It was a short but informative visit. I was shown the original artist paintings of what would be the Master ROM 64 retail package artwork, and he even took the time to scan the original Master ROM 64 manual for me. He has only one original copy of that manual, and he wanted to keep that, of course. Gus filled me in on more additional interesting history regarding Master ROM 64 as well. Master ROM, as it came to be known, was initially developed under a different name by a small company in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Gus couldn't recall the name, but more on that in a minute. Norlin purchased the rights, including source code, to the C64 kernel replacement, and Gus further developed and refined the code and eventually released it as Master ROM 64. Now, regarding Master ROM's predecessor. In another interesting coincidence, when I first started collecting retro computers years ago, a gentleman in Toronto gave me a nasty old plastic box filled with dozens of old ICs from a variety of 80s computers. They were in ESD foam, which was also from the 80s, and as you can imagine, sorting through them was a long and messy task. There were a lot of EEPROMs in this lot of chips, and I specifically remember one with a handwritten label on it with the words Master Aid showing faintly on the label. I went digging, found the EEPROM I remembered, popped it into my Test C64, and to my amazement, what did I see? Master Aid 64. The ready screen looked very similar to the Master ROM one, although in an all black screen and slightly different text, not to mention the name, Master Aid 64. This had to be the precursor to Master ROM 64. I had no other information on this Master Aid product. So if anyone knows anything about it, please leave comments below and help me fill in the historical blanks. Gus has given me permission to dump the Master ROM EEPROM image and distribute the binary file along with the scans of the original manual freely to the retro computer community. I have massaged the scans of the Master ROM manual and created an easier to read PDF. Best of all, these files are now available for anyone to download and enjoy. So check out the link in the description and download it today. Now, if you made it this far into the video, then first of all, thank you very much. But you're probably saying to yourself, uh, nice story, Mindflare Retro, but why haven't you shown us Master ROM 64 in action? Well, I could, but who better to do a quick overview of this kernel software than my friend and fellow Canadian, Robin, at 8-Bit Show and Tell YouTube channel. Hi, it's Robin. Mindflare Retro asked me to take a look at the Master ROM 64 kernel replacement and see if I could figure out anything about how it worked or how it was made. So we're going to use the Easy Flash 3 kernel replacement feature to install Master ROM in the C64 without having to physically put a ROM replacement in it. So here we are, booted up in Master ROM 3. I know that other kernel replacements such as Jiffy DOS actually borrow a large amount of Commodore's code, and I figured this was probably no different. So location FF80 contains the kernel version byte. So we use this new equals H command built into Master ROM to do a hex conversion because I find FF80 easier to remember than the decimal equivalent of 65408. And we'll peek that, 65408, and it returns a 3. So it appears that Master ROM is based on kernel version 3, which is the final version Commodore released. So I did a comparison between Master ROM 64 and kernel version 3, and there are 1,801 bytes different. That's about 22% of the ROM has been changed, and the other 78% is borrowed directly from Commodore's ROM. I'm not sure about the legality of this, but I never heard of Commodore actually going after any of these ROM replacement manufacturers. Presumably they knew whoever bought one had already bought a legitimate C64 with a legal kernel ROM already in it. So I've got my micro IEC here with Supermon 64 on it. Where does Master ROM find room for these new kernel enhancements? Well, it pulls all the cassette code out and actually defaults to device 8, the disk drive. So we don't have to add comma 8 here. 
and we'll run Supermon and just take a look at a couple differences here. The first change made in the ROM is here at location E227 in a stock C64 kernel. This is actually a load X with one device one, which is the cassette. And instead, it's loading X from BA, which stores the last device number, which defaults to eight in this case. And actually, if you load from device nine last, the next load command will automatically also do device nine. Another example is here at E470. Normally the Commodore 64 basic version two message appears here. And instead you can see it's being replaced with this Master ROM 64, copyright 1987 by Norland. Interesting that Commodore's copyright isn't acknowledged here, but yeah. One other little change is here at ECD9. This is the background and border color. You can see that they're set to C, which is this new gray default that's used. Normally this is color E and color six, which are the classic blue colors that we're used to see. That's a very quick look at a few of the changes in Master ROM 64. I'll have a more detailed look at it on my channel, 8-Bit Show and Tell, if you want to check that out later. Thanks to Mindflare Retro for making this discovery. It's been fun taking a look at it. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Robin. Now, if you really want to get into the guts of it, Robin has also just posted a video on his channel where he does a deep dive into the inner workings of Master ROM 64 and demos its functions. Again, there is a link to his video in the description below. Now, maybe it's just me, but I think this is super cool. What are the odds that all of these events would culminate in the re-earthing of a nifty little bit of C64 history? And speaking of nifty, if you want to be a real retro player and get weird looks from people at the grocery store, I have made available a Master ROM t-shirt sporting the original artwork, available via a link below. Finally, to celebrate the inaugural World of Retro Computing Expo taking place this weekend, September 25th, 2021, in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada, all Mindflare Retro t-shirts and related merch is 10% off until September 30th, 2021. Coupon code is below. This was a bit of a different video for me. A fun look into this little piece of pretty well forgotten Commodore 64 history with a Canadian twist. I hope you liked following along with my journey to rediscovering Master ROM 64. Please be sure to check out Robin's video. A super huge thanks to Game Whisperer for his super sleuth detective work. I don't think I would have ever met with our man Gus without Game Whisperer's invaluable help. Go easy, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your time, and I will see you again soon.